live. when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, this is his wife, 
and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for my sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld a woman, and she was indeed fair. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and men servants, maid servants, and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house because with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to, my, to me to wife. Now therefore, behold, take thy wife, take her, and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Amen. Amen. What we see in this text is that Abraham lied to protect himself. This pattern was still present in Abraham's life after his call. You see, he was a young Christian. It was only at the top of that, of that, that chapter that God has called Abraham. And he called him and he said, Come Abraham, leave your father, leave your mother, leave your family, leave your land and come. And sh I will show you a land that I am going to bless you with. And you are going to be a blessing to the world. This was a pattern in Abraham's life. Maybe when he was young, he realized that he can tell a lie and get away with it. Maybe when he was young and his father asked, who stole the cookie? He says, my brother, he's out in the field. And he realized and he learned early in life that he can tell a lie and get away with it. And this pattern was still present in Abraham's life. And God brings a trial to expose and deal with this character flaw. This character, and, and it didn't get eradicated right there. But it brought, was brought to the surface so that God can begin to deal with it. Amen. We see the same character flaw in Genesis chapter 20 again, where Abraham lies to Abimelech so he can save himself. This tends to show up character flaws in our, in our lives as people of God. Sometimes it's anger. Sometimes it's impatience. Sometimes it is distrust for God and others. Sometimes it's anxiety. Sometimes it's even lying, as we see here with Abraham. Let me say to you, child of God, whatever character flaws we do not get rid of in our life will ultimately hurt those around us. Amen. In this story, it puts Abraham's wife in a terrible situation. Moreover, we will see later on, we see that in the Genesis narrative, that lying became a character flaw in the lives of Isaac, Abraham's son. He also told lie. And then it was in the life of Jacob, his grandson. And it followed in the life of Jacob's children, his great-grandchildren. God does not want this character trait in his children. And he's constantly working in us to get rid of that. And one of the ways that God is going to get rid of character flaws in our lives is by through the gracious fire of trials in our lives. Amen. Because Amen. trials come to reveal our character weaknesses Amen. so that we can deal with them. Amen. God brings them in our, up in our life. He puts us in trials so that we can see them and we can deal with them. Amen. Amen. And God deals with us in the same way. And I wonder what I, what I want to show you in this chapter is there are principles. Now you and I might say, well, we don't lie. <laughs> but what I want to show you is that there are principles we can draw out of here to help us. Help us understand our character flaws and allow God to fix them. How many of you want God to fix character flaws in your life? Amen. 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 Abraham does not handle this trial, this famine, correctly. And so he is a model to us of failure in the Christian life. 
Later on, Abraham matured and he became a man of faith. But in his early life, this character flaw showed up and God wanted to deal with it. Scripture teaches that even the failures of God's people are meant to be examples for us. That's right. Amen? Amen? Israel's failures in the wilderness, the scripture says, these are recorded as examples for you and I. Right. So that we do not fall like they did. So that we do not set our heart on evil things as they did. That's what the scripture says. Their failures were recorded and remain as examples for you and I. So what important spiritual principles can we learn from this? Allow me to expose this text for a minute. And I want to bring to you some spiritual principles to help us when we face trials. The first one we found right there in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Imagine this. God calls Abraham. He says, come Abraham, I'm going to take you out of your land, your family, and I'm going to make you a blessing. I'm going to give you a land. Abraham gets to the land, and there's a famine. It could have been anything that caused a famine, a drought, a disease, crop, a plague of locusts. Maybe it was just a failed harvest. No doubt, Abraham is shocked. He left his family, his land, his people, and he came at God's command, and he walks right into a famine. He had left his hometown, and he came. It is quite possible that Abraham never experienced a famine in his life. He didn't know what it was to ever go hungry. He lived in, 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 the, in, the, in the valley of Ur. That was close to the Euphrates River. It was always a pleasant and a fruitful place. Abraham probably never knew what a famine looked like. And this is very common experience for you and I. Often, we feel that because we are following God, we should never have troubles. Right. Amen? Yeah. But this is not true. Right. Many times our problem is exactly because we are following God. Yeah. 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 See, we live in a fallen world. Physically, sin affected everything that we know. There are droughts and floods, there are sicknesses and death. And even though we are following God, we are still affected by these things. Yes. There is also spiritual persecution. Right. Satan doesn't want you to follow God, so he's going to bring troubles in your life. Right. He did that with Jesus in the wilderness. Amen. He did that with Job. His, 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 he, what he wanted to do was cause Job to fall away from following God. That's right. He brought sickness and bankruptcy and death and all so he can cause Job to turn away from God. Ultimately, all trials is going to be used by God to have his children grow. Yeah. That's right. Amen? Yeah. And because of this reality, the first principle I want you to know is that you must expect trials in your life. Uh -huh. As a child of God, expect it. And we can discern this from, from the narrative of the scripture also. Think of this. Joseph had a vision of his parents and his brothers bowing down to him. Soon after, he got sold into slavery. Yeah. Trial. Sure. Moses killed a man, expecting that he's going to become Israel's deliverer. Right after he has a run for his life, he spends 40 years in the wilderness. Yeah. Trial. Mm -hmm. Elijah faces up Ahab and, and, and the prophets of Baal. And soon after that, victory! Yet, God sent him to hide. Trial. Trials come to those following God. James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you yeah. fall into diverse temptations. Yeah. Notice he does not say if, but when. Yeah. That's right. When you fall into diverse temptations, essentially he's saying you must expect them. Peter says the same thing. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Sometimes we are tempted to think that we are going through trials because of we have sinned in some way. God is angry of us, or because we have not of discerned his will properly. But think with me. Consider what Jesus said. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more yeah. fruitful. He says, every branch that does bear fruit 
Pruning is cutting away at the things, the dead and the damaged branch. It implies pain. Yeah. Every branch that is fruitful, he cuts at it so that it could become more yes, fruitful. Yes, 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 yes. No doubt, this is what is happening in Abraham's life. He had been faithful. He had answered the call. God, he has followed God and he has now showed up in Canaan. And God is beginning to prune him so that he can become more faithful and more fruitful. Yeah. See, his was a very important call. And God does not waste any time preparing Abraham for this great law. He immediately sends him into a famine so that he can begin to prune him. God wanted to cut away old habits, sinful, sinful attitudes, self-reliance. These old attitudes were unfit for the call that was on Abraham's life. Yes. And God was going to fix it. Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen? Consider what the writer of Hebrews says. End your hardship as discipline, for God is treating you as sons. For what son is there that is not disciplined by his father? He was saying to these Hebrew Christians that you are being persecuted for your faith, but I want you to see them as coming from the gracious hand of God. Yes. I want you to see that these trials are coming your way because God has deemed them because he wants to make you fruitful and faithful. Amen. We should see our trials in the same way. And so when they come, we should expect them and we should endure them. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. A second principle I see comes from verses 11 to 13. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter Egypt that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, and they will take thee. Say, I pray thee, that you are my sister. The next thing we can discern from Abraham's trials is the example that with every temptation, there is going to, with every trial, there is going to come a temptation. Have you noticed that? Every time a trial comes your way, Satan is coming right behind you to tempt you to do everything that God doesn't want you to do. In this text right here, we see Abraham committing two failures. Firstly, we see that when the famine comes, Abraham immediately leaves the promised land and he goes to Egypt. Secondly, we see that Abraham devises a plan to lie about his wife, saying that she's his sister. Ultimately, both decisions Abraham made was absent of God. Do you see that? He takes this decision on his own. He doesn't build an altar. He doesn't call on God. He doesn't ask God, God, should I go down to Egypt? Now you may say, well, why is it a sin that he went down into Egypt? You see, because figuratively, figuratively, Egypt in Scripture is always talking about an alliance with the world and depending on self. Yeah. Hear what Isaiah say. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Yes, 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 yes. When we take it upon ourselves when trials come to do our own thing and go our own way, then we are committing sin. Yes. Amen? Yes. We should remember also, but you say, okay, it's sin to go down in Egypt. But we see throughout scripture that God tells people to go down to Egypt. You will tell me, that surely, throughout God's Israel's history, God at times called his people to go to Egypt. He told Jacob, uh, uh, he says, Joseph is now in Egypt, he's a prime minister. Go down there, I will sustain you, but I will bring you back. During the time when Herod was, was killing the babies, God told Jesus' dad, Joseph, he said, take your family down into Egypt, you will be safe there, and I will call you back. So the fact that Abraham left Canaan and went down to Egypt in itself was not a sin. The problem is that he did not consult God. He didn't ask God. He did not build an altar. He didn't call God. And he never, besides, God never told Abraham to go down to Egypt. No doubt, Abraham became anxious and he decided to take matters into his own hands. Going to Egypt is a picture of self-reliance, and self-reliance is always a sin in God's eyes. Yeah. Yeah. He goes to Egypt and he concocts this plan to protect himself. We must be aware that every trial brings with it a temptation. We see it with Christ. 
in the wilderness, Satan tempted him. And there is a temptation in every one of our trials. Let's think of your everyday life. You get stuck in tra traffic, there's a temptation to become impatient, anxious, and even angry. Huh? You, there's a conflict at work, or in your family, there's a temptation to hold grudges, to respond harshly, even to cut people off and don't talk to them again. <laughs> we must choose correctly. We have an opportunity to grow in patience and love and gentleness, and we have an opportunity to fix things and react differently. Instead, sometimes we just do the opposite, and we build sin, and we build frustration in our lives when we don't do what God expects us from. Amen? Amen. Every trial comes with an opportunity to grow or to fall further into sin. Yeah. Amen. Abraham had the opportunity to trust God and seek his God face while he was in that famine. Yet, he chose to took matters into his own hand and trust his own wisdom. He chose to sin instead of practice his faith and rely on God. We are no different sometimes, church. Trials come, we resort to lying, we display anger, we become impatient, we throw a pity party. <laughs> Satan knows our inclinations and starts the very same thing he brings to us. He entices us so that we can fail. But if you would understand that with every trial comes a temptation, then you would know how to react. You would know that when you're in traffic and that person next to you is about to cut you off, you would know that you need to stay quiet. That's right. That's right. Hmm? When that co-worker gets on your nerves, you would know just to smile and turn around and leave them alone. That's right. Amen? Because Satan knows where your weaknesses are and he's going to bring exactly that to you. That's right. That kind of temptation so that you could, you could fall. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we fix this? How do we fix this? We must seek God's wisdom when trials come. Amen. That's my third principle to you. Seek God's wisdom. As we consider Abraham's failure to seek the Lord, it gives us this next principle. Abraham headed straight for Egypt. He doesn't call God. He doesn't ask. Many times we do the same. Instead of looking to God and asking we get anxious and we begin scheming. <laughs> Come on now. Amen. You know I'm telling the truth. Amen. And if we want to respond correctly to trials, we must seek the Lord's wisdom for his, in our trials. Amen. So you say, how do we seek God's wisdom? Get down with prayer. Amen. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, Ask of God. Yeah. He gives generous cleaning yeah. as a fine fault. Yeah. He will give you liberally all the wisdom you need. Yeah. You just need to pray. Yeah. In the context of, of trials, James is telling us that we need to pray for wisdom because God does not withhold wisdom from his people when they ask. Yeah. Trials are meant to make us depend on God more. They are an invitation to pray and wait on God. Sometimes his answer is going to be to remove the trial. Sometimes his answer is going to give you wisdom and strength to persevere in the trial. But always with his answer, he is going to give you wisdom to respond properly to the trial. Amen. Amen. Seek God's wisdom through prayer. Seek his wisdom through studying his word. David said, your word is a lamp unto my feet. Basically saying, Lord, when I start to study your work, the word, the, the light turns on. Yeah. I can see where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. I can see what is going on. Yeah. I can see which part to take. Yeah. And scripture many times tells us exactly what to do. Yeah. Especially in moral issues. Yeah. Should I date an unbeliever? No. That's Should I marry an unbeliever? No. Should I cheat on this test? No. Directly. And when it doesn't give us exact answers, it gives us wisdom principles. Amen. It teaches us principles about wealth and marriage and conflict resolution and plan. We must seek God wisdom through his word. Hallelujah. 
seek God's wisdom through the counsel of mature Christians also. We have the church. We have godly mentors and godly counselors. We could seek God's wisdom through mature Christians. One person is the eye, another is the leg, another is the hand. Yeah. We depend on each other. Yeah. I know this is hard to accept, especially in, in an individualistic society. But if it is not accepted, the consequences can be devastating. Yes. Yes. Some people date the wrong people. They marry the wrong people. They make bad decisions about their future because they operate independent of God's oh, body. That's so true. They don't ask for counsel. The scripture says, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Amen. There is victory and protection when you have godly counselors around you. Now, with all of this said, Abraham did not have the scriptures. He did not have a church to help him. But I want to tell you that God spoke directly to him. That's how God did it at that time. But today, you and I, the only thing we have is this. Amen. That's right. Amen. This is what we have. God has chosen in the last days to reveal himself through his word. Amen. So take it seriously. Yes. And follow after it. Amen. Amen. There is protection in the church, there was protection in godly mentors. There was protection in godly counsel. God gave us brothers and sisters so that we can mingle with them and rub off on them and find counsel and find help through brothers and sisters in the church. Amen. Seek wisdom from godly mentors in your church. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So when we go through trials, seek God's wisdom through prayer, through his word, and through godly counselors. Amen. Let me move on here. I see a fourth principle coming out of chapter 40, uh, verses 14 and 16. And it is this. We must consider the consequences of sin when we face trials. Listen. And it came to pass. How can we know the story? The next principle we know that we must consider the consequences of sin. If we are aware of the consequences, it will help to dissuade us from sinning and instead encourage us to trust God. Abraham moved from Canaan down into Egypt. The Egyptians saw him.